Okay. Now I need to unmute myself. Oh, you can? Oh, good. Hello? Oh, yeah. we've, got, we've got muted all this technology. Anyway, great uh, to talk with some of you before it started, and we're, uh, we're on the road now. So, uh, so much fun to be here. Well, greetings and salutations, all my friends. Uh, thank you for tuning in. This is the first of, a, uh, of four in a series of, on reincarnation. Um, the first part of the series will cover a wide range of uh, subjects based on your questions. Uh, but I must preface this uh, first part by uh, sharing with you who I am. Um, a lot of people don't kind of uh, understand who I really am. And it's very simple. I, um, I, I didn't start out as a spiritual person. I didn't start out as a New Ager, and I'm still not a New Ager. So uh, some people confuse me for New Ager sometimes because some of the information crosses over. But I'm... Uh, Basically, I was a, a, a regular average guy when I died, and uh, in other words, I didn't have a clue about life, the universe, or anything. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my NDE that prefaces my, uh, what I've learned from the uh, near-death experience uh, over the last uh, 30 years uh, to kind of show you where I'm coming from here. Um, all the researchers that have looked into my case point out a couple of things, but the, the most interesting thing they point out about my, my experience was that um, when I had this experience and I did go to the light and all that, I was a fairly clueless person, and I saw things um, that uh, amazed me, of course, but, but some things may surprise you, and that is, I'll give you, an, uh, this is why my experience seems to be so different, and that is... Um, when I saw the light and I had my first initial uh, comfort zone with it, knowing that I wasn't going to go to hell and, and I wasn't going to be punished, um, I was then presented with um, something that comes out of us all. Um, I was uh, presented with images that, that some typical near-deathers may seem, uh, like Jesus and that sort of thing. And I'm telling you, I, I saw Jesus on the other side, and I was blown away by the energy and the feeling uh, that I was receiving. But I asked the light. I said, I don't believe in Jesus. I, 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 I don't believe he was ever real or anything like that. What am I really seeing here? And this is what's so different about my case, researchers say, is that I asked to see beyond the illusion or beyond the images I was being presented. And uh, the light thought that was very interesting. And so when I asked the light, what am I really seeing here? Because I was seeing for the first time in my life and feeling what we call the Christ energy the Christ matrix, and but I didn't believe in Christ, I still don't, so forgive me for saying that, but I still don't believe in, in that whole story, but I asked the light, where is this coming from, and the light showed me my uh, programming from childhood, to Catholic boarding school, and all of that, and so my earliest programming was about Jesus, and about all of that, and of course, um, when you have a near-death experience, what's presented to you first and foremost is what you're most comfortable with. And that's fine, that's beautiful. But I asked to see beyond these things, and that's how my conversation began with the light. Um, and so my, my, my near-death experience was finally getting access to a, to a school. Um, I'm someone whose parents didn't think education was worth anything. I didn't have a chance to get an education except uh, on the street, so to speak, and, and in apprenticeships. But my, my near-death experience was for me, and it's always been the most important thing to me. And I never felt the need to evangelize or put out books or anything. In fact, I may be the only near-deather on earth that hasn't put out a book so far. That's because I had access now to a school. It was like getting a scholarship to a great university. And my daily visits with the light over the last 30 years have been my school, and I never felt prepared really to write a book about this. I'm still learning. It's, um, I'm not putting anybody down, but it's quite common now to have a two or three minute near death experience come right back and write a book. Well, there's about a seven year learning phase for most near deathers, if you check the work of uh, PMH Atwater and Ken Ring and others, there's about a seven year assimilation process. And let me tell you, it's, things change. I had the opportunity to go back to the light, and you've all probably read my original story, which I called my children's story. That, that, that I wrote down um, after my near death because um, uh, I'd been introduced by Phyllis Atwater to a, a professor at a university, and the universe, uh, he asked me to write down my story, 
and I wrote down as much as I could. It's only, uh, gosh, just not that many pages if you've read the whole story. But it was the first flush, and um, I had a feeling it was a child's story. I had this feeling that there was so much more to learn and, and to look at. And so, uh, oddly enough, I, I sent this story for him for his research, and he put it on the Internet without my permission. That's how this whole thing got started. I never put it on the Internet myself originally. And then... Um, and then I got uh, uh, lots of people writing to see if they could uh, use my story in their books, and I've always given most everybody permission to use my story. And so um, that's kind of how my story got out. Um, I actually didn't, didn't have much to do with it. I've had to, I've had to deal with it ever since. Thank you. And at first, I was very angry at this professor, very, very angry that I felt like he betrayed me. But he said he did it out of love. So where do you go with that? So for me. What I've learned does not come from old books, doesn't come from gurus, and there are many great gurus, and it doesn't come from old dogmas. Um, and I want, to, I want to let you know that this is, this is my education. This is my joy in life, is learning what I can learn and not being told what to believe in by anybody. And um, so uh, for me, I have been in school for 30 years, and only now do I even, even think about maybe... Uh, uh, Doing, doing something with all of this. Uh, I've given seminars and things like that over the years, but uh, very sparingly, as most of you know, and I've tried to avoid the spotlight. And uh, so that's kind of the big difference in my story. Um, I've had 30 years to digest, go back to the light and say uh, about that original story, which I've, I've gone back to the light many times in the early days, to go back and say, now about that part of my story, I want to see some other level, one of the other levels to it. And, you know, and that, the light will open up to you. I, I got to, if I wanted to see it on the quantum physics level, I could. If I wanted to see it on the emotional level, I could. And kind of put all the whole picture together for me that I would understand. And not that I know everything or know anything or am any expert on anything, but I have learned something in this last 30 years. And if you knew how hard-headed I was, <laughs> that's quite a statement. Now, during this... Um, during the series, we're going to do some interesting things, and this may be the biggest, this first part of the series may be the biggest stretch for all of us, including me. And that is um, that during the series, we will kiss this subject from a natural perspective. And, and if you don't know what the KISS means, it means keep it super simple. That's one of the great lessons I learned from the light. The human mind, uh, especially the, the upper brain, has a way of, of just complicating everything everything, everything, and that's not where the real knowledge is. And so if you just operate on that level, uh, it, it, it becomes kind of um, uh, psycho babble at some point. Um, I want you to understand that what I've learned is that the universe is mostly non-intellectual universe. It cannot be understood strictly intellectually, and the universe is not supernatural. There is nothing supernatural in the universe. It's all natural, what we call miracles, what we call subtle energies, what we call spirit, all so very natural. And because it is natural, it has quantum physics behind it. It has all of this behind it. It's not just an esoteric teaching. My teachings will never be esoteric. And, of course, the meaning of esoteric is uh, mystery schools, uh, secret teachings. Only special people can learn this stuff. That day is long past. So this is not an esoteric teaching. This is just telling you what I have learned from my questions with the light. The other thing that I've learned, not, I've learned to, uh, the light has taught me, is not to take an aimless course of splitting hairs to infinity, which is what the upper brain can do. We can split hairs to infinity all day, and we'll, still, we'll, uh, we'll just end up confused at the end of it. The other thing is, I am not a philosopher. I am not a blind medium. I have always had a practical relationship with what I call the light of life. I don't call it the light of God. I call it the light of life. Um, in my experience with the light, I was never encouraged or told to believe in any kind of deities or gods or anything like that because I asked to see what that was all about. And for me, it's not the light of God. It's the light of life. And I've actually upset some radio show people, some Christians, when I call this, they want to call it the light of God. Well, fine, if you want to, but for me, it's the light of life. Although I, I, I didn't 
I wasn't taught to believe in deities, and I was shown where all that comes from, and it's all cool and natural for the most part. Um, but uh, what we do know what religions have done on the planet so far, and uh, it's not very pretty what most of it, what most of the four main religions have been up to uh, for thousands of years now. Uh, but that aside, what, what I did learn from the light, which gave me life again, which gave me hope, and still gets me to this day, is that I didn't believe in anything. And the light, and in my conversations, and in my explorations, I learned that there is a real spirit here. It's magnificent. It's not hocus pocus. It's not uh, some white guy in the sky sitting on a golden throne to worship forever. I learned that there's a real spirit here. It's called the spirit of life. It's really tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can love it. You can hug it. You can do everything you want with it. And what we've done with our religions and esoteric teachings and all this philosophy is actually get away from the natural and go way deep into the supernatural. When you say something supernatural, you've just separated it from the rest of everything else. Everything is natural. Everything that we know, psychic abilities, talking to the dead, which I'll talk about probably today in my notes. Um, so this is a natural universe. This is, and spirit is as natural as anything can be. The other thing that I learned is that Reincarnation is more real than most people even imagine at this point. Certainly more real than, forgive me for saying this, uh, explanations from ancient civilizations. Much more real than that. Um, the, the idea that I was shown is that reincarnation is the most common thing the entire universe does. Everything in the universe reincarnates in its own way. Uh, energy never dies. It goes through transition states. When a star dies, it creates new stars. Everything this universe does reincarnates and expands. And that's uh, something that's very, very uh, cool to understand. Reincarnation is the most natural thing the entire universe does. And guess what? We are made of every part of the entire universe. What is not in us that is not in this universe? Physically, mentally, you name it. What is not in us that is not in the whole universe itself? So uh, we're going to take a natural look at this. And this may stretch some people because... Um, this is strictly information without going to special teachers or anything like that. But here's two things I want you to think about as we begin this course. <clears throat> and some people say they've never heard this question before. And that is, if there were no deities or gods whatsoever, would there still be an afterlife? You ever thought about that? Some of you haven't even stopped to think about that. I have. And I've spent a lot of time on this kind of a subject, and I can tell you with a resounding yes, there is still an afterlife without any deities whatsoever. Because if you really think about it honestly, whose deity is the best deity? Is it our modern deities? Is it the past deities when millions of people believed in those deities? Whose deity is the most real deity? People have been fighting over this for a long time. These deities come and go all through history, and so will what we call our modern day religions. Uh, hundreds and, and even, uh, within even a hundred years from now, things will be very, very different about how we do our cosmic conceptions. So, um, so there is an afterlife with or without deities. Um, and here's the other thing that may stretch you really deeply, and that is something pretty amazing. And that is, for some people, it may be hard to believe in UFOs. For other people, it may be hard to believe in God, and all that seems impossible. It may be hard to believe in yourself, even. But there's something even more wild that stretches your belief system, and this is what the light has shown me. And that is, what if, just ask yourself this question, what if we are the first garden? What if we are the first life. Now, before you say that's impossible, understand what we've, we've, we've discovered with our modern science so accurately. Did you know that the Milky Way galaxy that we're a part of is one of the oldest objects in the entire universe? It formed very shortly after what we call the Big Bang. It's one of the oldest galaxies, if not the oldest galaxy in the universe. Now, if life were going to start anywhere first, would it start here? 
Would it start in the early galaxies? I think so. So there is a possibility, there is a possibility, a real possibility that we may be the first life here. Maybe in our galaxy, who knows, maybe in the universe. And by that, I mean wake up and start cherishing what we have. Let's not throw it away. What if we're the start of everything? It could be. It's not as impossible as you think. It's certainly as possible as anything else. Um, so what if we are the first life? What if that's our responsibility to carry this on in starseed throughout the galaxy and beyond? Think about that. I always have an open mind to that, and it is a possibility just as any other possibility is. But it is a serious possibility, and it has some science behind it. Um, so cherish what we have. Well, what if we acted like we were the first and we are the fathers and mothers of civilizations to come? God, doesn't that give you a tingle? Doesn't that make you want to just be more responsible and, and take care of this world that we have, take care of this life, take care of our children? Think about that. Still gets me. I have a slew of questions here that uh, everybody sent in, and wow, I may not, I probably won't get to all of them. I've, I've read through all of them. I've highlighted some that I think we can get to in this first section. I will be addressing the rest in appropriate sections, because during this course, um, this first course is really uh, the evolution of ancient concepts, uh, lessons uh, the natural universe can teach us about reincarnation. That's what we'll be going through today. And that will be probably one of the biggest stretches for you, uh, to just look at something completely different. And not reading a book, not having a guru tell you, just kind of look at something that uh, comes from a completely different angle. The uh, second part of this is going to be reincarnation among family, friends, and lovers, the big karma and reincarnation. That's going to be a lot of fun. I have a lot of questions on those subjects. The third one is past life uh, uh, reincarnation, the future progressions, uh, future life progressions, and rescuing your lost self. What's the reality here? Is there some quantum physics to it even? Is there a real threat here? And can we change that? more than you even imagine and more simple than you even imagine did you this will show you what kind of power you really have and true power is not power over others it's power within yourself it's your power that's true power and what you can change with that true power once you're aware of it is astounding it's amazing it can change history any one of us can do that and by the way the cat's out of the bag it's already happening so, and the fourth one, which is one of the main things that I'm going to be teaching the rest of this life, um, is uh, preparing for your next life and the future of reincarnation. Because, you know, everything evolves. We know this. Everything in the entire universe evolves, including what we call the oversoul, including what we call Godhead. It all evolves. And the, the nature and structure and quantum physics of reincarnation will change now and we'll get into that in the fourth part because that's really quite deep and quite amazing how this is going to change the whole concept of reincarnation is evolving to its next level also so uh, this is going to be a very fun fun series for us all so let's get to some questions here that will uh, and these questions will kind of sample everything we're going to go through in this um, particular um, uh, series um, so I've got a question here from a, from a good friend. Uh, his his, uh, his uh, uh, email is uh, seeker812, uh, and um, a good friend. We've had a lot of good chats and things like that. Uh, now, he has a great question here, and that question is, you talk about Gaia, but are there different Gaias for other planets with life out there? And I say, maybe, probably, hopefully so. But remember that if there is other life anywhere in the universe, there is a commonality in it all. And this is where I think my UFO friends kind of don't even, they don't even get to. And that is that if there is life in this universe, there are going to be some commonalities in all life, no matter what star system, no matter what color star you come from, all of that. Because the different gravities, different planet sizes, uh, the radiations from a red star, blue star, a white star, all determine a certain form of evolution. But within all of that, in all of that evolution, 
evolution, there is a single consciousness. There is something that's really amazing, and it's called atomic order. All life, is based, as we know it, is based on an atomic order. And that takes a great deal of knowledge and consciousness to change, as our scientists have found out and as our metaphysicians have found out over time. Uh, to change the natural order of the universe, which is our safety net, by the way. Just think if the universe changed just because Atlanteans wanted it to, whoa, where would we be now? Hmm? And uh, <laughs> what if it changed the way uh, old George Bush wanted it to be? Oh, God, help us. So there is a, there is a common safety net, and that's called the atomic order. Because this is a natural universe, and everything in the universe is evolving to where we are now, including the natural uh, reincarnation process that happens on all levels, all the time, no matter if we're aware of it or not. Um, there is a similar core of essences in all what we might call life, and basically the kind of life that we're really uh, going to be able to communicate with, as we know, is biological life. That's the first kind of life that the universe seems to add this type of higher consciousness to, that evolves from this type of higher consciousness. But it's interesting to understand that although we are biological, uh, we have come from uh, an inorganic universe to start with. So imagine an organic, let's say a rock. Imagine there's a rock and it becomes conscious. That's us. The universe is becoming conscious through beings like us, becoming conscious and more conscious all the time. So, um, so it really depends. Uh, there is a common core, and that's why uh, when, I, when I speak at conferences and UFO people come up and they want to talk about this or that, there is a common thread. It's called biology and atomic order through all this in the universe. And um, uh, so that is something that, that is common among all of us and is a thread through everything that we know. And that all depends on where you come from, what star do you come from. So, but there will be a common thread, and that's how, in the end, we can all learn to communicate. And um, the other thing is that the next question here, oh, let's see here. The next question is, hold on, ah, here we go. The next question is uh, from uh, my friend Laura in New York, and uh, she says, and this is a fascinating question, she always has the best questions, um, the question is, is it possible, and how is it possible to communicate with non-physical uh, beings who have died and already, and have, have already supposedly gone to the other side kind of thing? Well, let, let me share this with you. That's, I, I've had uh, several people have asked a very similar type of question. Um, and here's, here's the interesting thing that's going to, going to maybe uh, rock you a little bit, and that is that I asked and have, have had this explained to me by the light in a very, uh, very sensible way, scientific way for me to understand. Um, and that is that the number one thing I can tell you, I've been to the other side more than once, and I can tell you that the other side is not all it's cracked up to be or built up to be by all these books and everything. It's not greater than this, than where we are now. There are so many things you cannot do on the other side. And by the way, what is the other side? What is it really? Um, what is this other side we go to? There's only life and transition states in life. I, I promise you, every time you die or close your eyes, they will open again. You don't believe me, test me on this. <laughs> test me. <laughs> every time you think you die, you will, you will reawaken. It's amazing. And so, what's the other side really like then? How do people communicate with the dead, quote the dead? And I, I have to tell you, this, this, may, this may shake up some people. I don't, I don't really mean to go after anybody, and I'm not actually, I'm just saying what I've learned. It turns out that talking to what we call the dead is one of the easiest things you could ever do. I don't know why they make big deals about these experts. The trick with all of this psychic stuff and, and all of this um, 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 uh, uh, communicating with the dead stuff is that everybody can do it. It's easier than you think. Most people are scared to try it. Most people talk themselves out of it. You know, they, I imagine that or whatever. The difference between the average person and, say, a professional, famous person who, quote, contacts the dead is that they practice. They become a concert pianist. Most of us are just playing chopsticks with all of this. 
So, uh, again, practice, practice, practice. But here's the interesting thing that, that may be a little different, and that is the other side is not nearly what people think it is, and there's so much you cannot do on the other side. And the light has taught me that body without a spirit is a wasteland, and spirit without a body is a wasteland. The perfect combination is body and spirit together in unison. Then you are truly unlimited. Because you're limited in body if you don't have spirit. You really are. And you're limited if you think you're just spirit on the other side. You're limited. You can't do much. Because when you're on the other side, you're kind of wherever you think you are instantly. It's, it's bang, 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 bang. It's all of that. And there's a lot of confusion on the other side. It's not all pretty and, and nice and neat. It's not all uh, good. It's not all bad. There's, the, there's everything on the other side. Um, but what we have is, uh, in most of the books that are written about the near-death experience, um, uh, especially lately, is basically a Christian, white guy in the sky kind of near-death experience. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But... The other side, here's how it works. When you, when you live a life, you create, you, create an, uh, you create an impression in the field. Call it the hologram. There's many words we've used for this, but, but this is more like a hologram that we're living in. And your life and your life's energy, what you speak, what you say, and to some extent what you think. Because thinking hasn't nearly as much energy as speaking what you think. And, and that's very powerful when you speak what you think. How many of you wish uh, once you've said something you could pull it back? It's very powerful. It has a lot more energy than when you're just thinking something. And so depending on your life, if you were an energetic person, if you were a high energy person, if you did a lot of things, and if you got out there a lot, you're going to leave a bigger impression in the field uh, than someone who lived the life of a bump on the log. It's just energy. And so, um, some, so what, what you're doing is you're leaving an impression in the field when you die, and that's created really by your life review. Um, as you download your life review into the matrix, the light of light, which is the huge matrix for our consciousness here. And so the, the, the idea here is that um, it's, like, it's like this. It's like you made a video recording before you died for your family and they can watch it. They can watch it uh, as many times as they want. But imagine if this recording, which is made of ectoplasm, which is alive and which keeps evolving, all of our thoughts keep evolving. Our thoughts are quanta, our thoughts are alive. Our thoughts, once they leave us, are, especially if we add a lot of vocal to it or singing or chanting, it has a lot of energy to keep going and evolving, and it will evolve on their own. So be careful many times what you wish or what you say to people, because it keeps evolving, it doesn't go away. Although you can, you can not only are we co-creators, we are also co-decreators. And my favorite tool for decreation of negative energy is my Native American drum. Uh, if, I have a, if I have a disturbing dream or, or I've got a friend that's ill, I drum a different beat. I drum it out. And it's a very powerful thing that we do. So we're co-creators and, and co-decreators. So don't be afraid to decreate some of the negative stuff in this world. But imagine that when you die and you have your life review and all that, you leave this impression in the book of life, the Akashic Records, whatever you want. To go. There's so many names for this matrix. And so when, when someone thinks they're contacting the dead, they're actually re re contacting this recording because you've left, every life you've lived has left a recording in the field. It's left an impression of information in the field that is held tightly together in this field by our, our electromagnetic system on uh, the planet Earth. It's, it's very interesting how it holds the energy here. And, and this is how we keep evolving in a collective intelligence. So, so imagine, so you're talking to an impression in the field. Now this, this impression, this recording is alive. It's, it's made of living ectoplasm. It does keep evolving on its own. And you can talk to it. It doesn't mean just because you go to the other side you get wise all of a sudden. That doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, you're going to learn anything that you didn't learn before. That can happen. But really, the whole set of life is about reincarnation, about regeneration. Because these bodies wear out. Everything wears out eventually. But we are able to overcome entropy by regeneration and reincarnation. We're overcoming the entropy that is in the universe. And so uh, it's very interesting. You can use this idea, this impression in the field, to create impressions for someone to see when they have their death or near-death experience. Interesting, isn't it?
with. So imagine this. There's someone you've always wanted to make up with, or there's someone you've always wanted to say something to, but you've lost touch with them, or they won't speak to you anymore, or you won't speak to them anymore, but your heart still has some love for them, or whatever. If you will, in, the pri in, the pri in your own privacy, talk to them out loud as if you were talking to them. Believe me, that energy goes to them. And they may not get it until they have their life review, but that will be included in their life review. Is your, they will see that. Uh, in my life review, I saw people that said they were sorry, that I, I, did never, I never heard them say they were sorry to me about things that had happened. I never knew that my biological father, who, who was a raging alcoholic, many times had prayed and said he was sorry. I never heard that in my life, but I saw it in my life review. So think about that. It's never over, is it? And so you can create these patterns and these recordings in the field that will play on, on uh, both your or the other person's uh, life review. And you just name their name. Name the name. It goes, and, and especially if you have a picture, it's called radionics, the science of radionics. This information will stick in their field until it is released in their life review. So it's fascinating how all this can work if you understand the, the physics and the quantum physics of it. For me, uh, there's some people that don't like science, there's some people that don't like um, uh, these kind of things, but to me it, it made things sacred again, it made things understandable, it made things doable, rather than esoteric philosophies and, and seventh heavens and all that sort of thing, because we're here. And um, so it's the most easiest thing in the world to learn to speak to people on the other side. The only course I, I recommend, frankly, is uh, the Silva course. They used to call it Silva Mind Control. If you want to save 20 years of searching and reading and studying, take their course. One weekend, you might be surprised at what you can do, what you, what's already in you that can be activated. Um, uh, so, so that's interesting. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing about reincarnation. Some people, uh, and this is something the light showed me that's kind of very fascinating as we keep evolving. What humans have is what I call human chauvinism. We don't, we separate ourselves from nature, don't we? In almost every way, we're more important than a tree, we're more important than a river, we're more important than anything. And that's human chauvinism. And if it doesn't have our type of intelligence, it isn't intelligent. And what are we finding now? Almost everything from ants to apes <laughs> seem to be very intelligent uh, with the more studies that have gone on. But human chauvinism and separating yourself from nature is, is really the first time you lose touch with reality because we are animals. We are animals. And I'm not ashamed to say that. We humans are animals. We evolved up this path. And as that, we're not that far out of the jungle right now. We're not that far out of the jungle. We've got a beautiful future ahead of us and we're just getting out of the jungle, thank goodness. And we're, we're about to evolve in ways that we're totally inhibited by, uh, by that kind of uh, primitive uh, uh, life uh, uh, existence. Now what's interesting is, is people say, well, where do all the new souls come from? Well, I, you know, the light told me this. The light has told me that there's only one life on this planet. And I'm not going to get into UFOs and all that stuff right now, but, but there's only one life on this planet and in the universe, basically. But on this planet, we all evolved, and it's traceable. It's actually traceable how we evolved. I won't get into weird theories and all that, but I'm telling you what the light told me. Um, and that is that we are, there's only one life on this planet Earth that is expanding as the universe is expanding. And so there's only one human on planet Earth. And that human is only one part of billions of life forms on this planet. And yet we're so arrogant. We're like the precocious star child who think we created the universe. And that's a very Atlantean kind of thinking. You know, the mind created the universe when uh, the universe actually created itself out of a natural outcome. And that's the other thing to try to remember is that this universe and our life is a beautiful, natural outcome. It wasn't planned. It didn't have to be planned. It's not about that kind of human mentality. And people are always expecting bigger and better, bigger and better, but that's industrial thinking. People didn't think that way a couple hundred years ago. Uh, but we have this modern industrial thinking where there's always going to be seventh heaven, 25th dimensions, and it's always going to be higher, higher, better, better, better. That isn't the way the universe works. The universe is this grand, natural outcome of this self-sustaining, regenerating, reincarnation.
reincarnating life and energy throughout the universe. But here's an interesting thing the, the, the uh, light told me, and we'll get into this when we get into the, uh, uh, the next course on uh, past lives and stuff like that. But just consider this. There's only one life here, so there's only one of us. And we're, we're opening up and we're expanding like a lotus flower opening. And there have been scientific, and, and uh, you know, the light tells me to look up stuff like this, and I go, and I find it. I mean, uh, it's interesting. The light said, uh, <clears throat> go look how many human bodies there have been on planet Earth since the first human body. You ever thought about that? I hadn't either. <laughs> but, but the light told me to go look it up, and there are, many, there are actually many people have thought about this. So um, I, I was surprised. Oh, uh, some estimates say that the, the count of human bodies on planet Earth since the first human has been around 80 billion humans have lived on planet Earth. That great expansion, and it's over time. There's a, there's a birth rate and a death rate. But the lines had calculated this way. There have been about 80 billion humans, and we're getting in that range that really becomes super intelligent when you get around that love, that order of magnitude, and that collective intelligence of those 80 billion beings that we are, we have been and we are, have accumulated this collective intelligence, including love, including art, and all of that. But if you divide that by the number of people on planet Earth right now, what do you get? You get around 10. If you say, oh, this is rounding up, say eight, let's just give it 8 billion, somewhere around 7, 8 billion. Let's say 8 billion. That's around 10 lives for everybody. And yet you have people that think they have lived thousands of lives, and that's okay, but, but that's not really natural. And this is just what I've been told. We have all lived, we, there's only one human here, so we have in us the memory of all humans. And so uh, the light has showed me that we're like this um, pearl or onion with all these layers on it from day one, from our tribal beginnings to the, the present. We are, we are a complex of magnetic memories and emotions that we have accumulated over many lives. And by that many lives, I mean we're all one being living all of these lives. So and the whole thing about collective intelligence is that not one person has to do all the work. Not one person had to do all the reincarnation. And nature's very conservative that way. And so um, what we have now is, is something very interesting. We're, we're at this point now where we're starting to kind of wake up to the Gaia concept, to what did my mother have to do with this, my being here, maybe I didn't create the universe with my mind, and things like that. But as we, as we move on now, we have one, we're going to begin to understand that there's one life here. The whole planet is one life. It's, you've got to really start feeling that in your heart. And with one life on this planet, and for all we may know, the first life, who knows, but we're all living. What this means, is, this incarnational thing means that of all the 80 billion people that have ever lived, bodies that have been on the planet, we're all living here right now. We're all alive. And when people ask me about, uh, here's the other question about how soon do we reincarnate? Well, what I learned is that um, it's not about time or anything like that. There, there are some real probabilities there that happen. Everything does reincarnate, whether you believe in it or not. You are attached to this matrix. You are attached to all the rest of us. And so there are some people saying in their philosophies, well, I'm never going to reincarnate it here. You don't need to reincarnate here. Uh, I'm done with humans. I'm done with planet Earth. Well, from a Gaia point of view, a very natural point of view, it's almost like saying, because we're one human, it's almost like saying you wake up one morning and your foot says to you, hey, I'm taking off to Cleveland, see you later. And the wildest fantasies may be possible, but not natural, not what's really going on here. And so people that want to get away, I, I really feel for them, I have empathy for them, but there's just no getting away. We have to get a handle on this life because this life is beautiful and it's, we are now just entering the realm of where life can be beautiful for all in the future. People don't even, most people don't even realize the great movements that are happening on planet Earth now. They're just concerned with what's on CNN and Fox News and Congress and that's where the least action is happening. Uh, the, the real evolution of this planet is not waiting for these guys. If you're waiting for them, you're, you're going to get way behind. But the rest of the life 
life and intelligence on this planet is not waiting for these guys to get it together. New economies are forming, new systems are forming right and left all around us. But the, the interesting concept is that we're all here. We're all here right now. And this is a, an amazing thing to remember uh, what we bring to this planet. Now, the, the, the next point before I go on about this is very, very interesting. Um, the light, very early on, got me into a subject called demographics. I didn't even know what it meant. The light wanted me to go and study demographics because I think many people have a misconception and I may write about this someday, a misconception of what the light is. The light is not a crystal ball. The light is not a power source. Uh, the light has no power whatsoever. It's not about power, and it's not about favor. If the light or, or the light of God, whatever you want to call it, favored anyone, we would know it. The, the, the bad guys, the light wouldn't shine on them. It's completely unbiased. If the light were biased, uh, believe me, I get this question uh, uh, fairly often in my emails is, can you, give, can you go to the light and give me the lottery number? I try. I do it. I play the lottery every week. And all I know is that you can't win unless you buy a ticket. Uh, it's, if, if the light was biased at all to your spirituality or to your spiritual evolution, then every enlightened person would be winning the lottery. I, I see no evidence of that whatsoever. So the light isn't a crystal ball. It, it's, it's just not about what you think it is. And it has no power whatsoever. There's no power there. You, you can't have power. You can have insight. Uh, you can have understanding. You can have regeneration. But the light really is, is there as, as a, a nexus, a, a cosmic record kind of thing. And that's why the light would encourage me to go do my work. And um, so when the light, very early on, um, and this starts like within the year after my near-death experience, the light encouraged me to go study demographics, which I've done. And I didn't even know what it meant. This is very crucial for us to understand right now. And this is one of the main reasons I will be teaching this course and I will be teaching the practice of reincarnation for the rest of this life I have on the planet now. And that is this. This is... Um, this is what I was told. And demographics, true demographic studies, absolutely agree with everything I've said. And if you've seen my uh, Spirit of Gaia, I talk about that a little bit in there. But we're, in a we're living in a period now, and this is what's so wild. We're living in a period now in which we are living in the largest population the Earth has ever known of humans and will ever know. The population will never be this big again. It isn't necessary for the future. Remember, we're all one human. You're all thinking as you're some kind of individual separate from anything, but you're not. We're one human being. So people that talk about being oneness, we're already as one as you can possibly be already. I, I, I just don't get it when everybody's talking about this oneness. You're already one biologically and everything. DNA is just amazing. We're already as one as you can be. Just realize it. But... What's about to happen is something that's never happened before on this planet, may not again, and it's all a part of the natural outcome of the nature of things. And that is that in true demographics, when you measure the populations on planet Earth, you really don't count the babies because you really don't know how long they're going to live, and you really don't count the old people because you don't know how long they're going to live. So you do kind of a, a, mid, a, a, a medium peak. The medium peak population on Earth today is uh, 50, 55 or over, and in many countries, someone's turning 65 every turn, 10 seconds. So not only are we living in a period in which there's been the largest population on planet Earth, but we are also going to live through the greatest die-off of the population the planet has ever known. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, it's natural, it's beautiful, what's about to happen. And I will explain this in, uh, in uh, our, uh, our fourth part in quite some detail. And what I mean by that is, if you're 55 or older now, where are you going to be in 2040, 2060? And I was told, and this is why I'm beginning this work now, I was told that between 2020 and 2040 is when the, the, when the, the crash in population really starts being noticeable to everybody. You're going to see your friends drop off very quickly. You're going to see, this is going to be worldwide, the subject of loss, the subject of all this, the subject of reincarnation is going to get even bigger. And, um, but what's interesting about this is that we all are 
we're going to reincarnate. And I'll talk, and I'm, I'm going to tease you with that. How do we reincarnate into a smaller population? Because literally, by uh, with the with the die off rate and the and the uh, you know the fertility um, has been measured. The fertility rates of women and men have been uh, and sperm rates of men have been measured very accurately for quite a while now. And we're at one of the lowest points uh, ever. Uh, so we just aren't reproducing fast enough. And that's because there isn't a need for this anymore. Uh, something else is happening, something else is going to change that makes us even wiser and even more multidimensional. And it's not leaving the body or anything, it's coming back into the body in a way that will, may, may surprise you. So we're living in this period now where whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, we're going to live, we're living in the largest population and the largest die-off on planet Earth. Um, some estimates say we may go down to five or four billion even. Uh, by 2100. Very, very, very good uh, science there. But a lot of spiritual people, a lot of people out there never even have looked at demographics. And demographics, as the light has told me, is the key fate, the key fate of, of us on this planet. And um, so what's so important about this is first to be aware of it, start preparing for your next life, start clearing up your life, start processing things. Don't don't do what I did. I was, a, I was just a royal mess when I went over the other side and had my life review. I was totally unprepared. My next one's going to be much smoother, I can tell you. Um, and um, so, but what this means is, is that whether you know it or not, uh, whether you believe it or not, we who are living now in this age range are going to leave the biggest legacy the planet has ever known. What legacy will that be? That's up to us. Will it be a legacy where we get our leaders under control? Will it be a legacy where we hold them accountable? Will it be a legacy where we do the most we can to regenerate the planet and all life on it? What legacy? Are we going to leave this a bigger mess than when we came? It's very important now at our age to start thinking about your legacy. And legacies don't have to be big million dollar things or big institutions. Every one of us, every single one of us has a legacy that we can leave to friends, family, and the planet. And this is what I want to get people starting to think about. This is the real reason I'm doing this course. And so uh, we will get deep into some subjects that may be disturbing until you get a grip on it and become comfortable with it. But we're going to look at uh, quantum physics. I, I, uh, when I was in Europe doing some talks, they, they really haven't had a New Age movement over there, so they don't want to hear all this stuff, you know, New Agey stuff. Uh, my uh, lectures in Europe were uh, really about uh, the near-death experience as a quantum physics event, and that went over, because it is a quantum physics event, it's, and what we call spirit is a part of quantum physics, it's quanta, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to understand, and it really gives you something to hold on to, and something to work with, than some esoteric philosophy, and uh, so, uh, so there is definitely quantum physics involved in our thoughts, our ectoplasm, quantum physics involved in all of this, and certainly involved in our, uh, our reincarnation process. So we're going to look at it in those kind of levels, and very natural levels, and from that, we will, uh, we will uh, answer all kinds of questions that I can, and I will continue to teach this the rest of my life, so, and we will, we will continue to work on this. Um, I've got a one, one, I'm gonna try to do a couple more questions here. Um, this is a question from uh, uh, Stephen or Stefan, and it says, uh, do we reincarnate, <coughs> excuse me, do we reincarnate with the same level of awareness we have attained in the lifetime, or are we starting all over again? A very good question. Well, the answer to that is <laughs> life is a dance that is two steps forward and one step back. You really can be a genius in one life and not so much in the next life, depending on a whole number of variables that can happen if you don't get a handle on your uh, and preserve your consciousness. Once you once you attain a certain level of consciousness, you can lose it. It's not that forever. You can be a Dalai Lama in one life and something else in another life. Um, it's, it's interesting how slippery this, what we call consciousness is. And once we get a grip on it and are able to hold on to it, it magnifies incredibly. Now, um, the thing about this is that two steps forward, one step back 
is progress. I've done the stance at uh, workshops of mine, and we'll circle the room, two steps forward, one step back. You'd be surprised how fast you get around the room, even though there's always one step back. This can happen. It's called the dance of life. Um, the um, uh, This is why it's very important that whatever level of consciousness you've attained and what, and, and what level you've attained of self-awareness, that you preserve it and you cherish it. And the next thing is that to practice, 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 especially at our age. Um, you practice daily. Say your prayers daily. I pray three times a day. Now, these are mantras. They're not religious prayers, and they're very short. But it's a statement of what I am in this life. I remind myself three times a day, what am I really in this life? Um, when this world, especially the snarky Internet, can try to rip everybody apart, it's so... Uh, you try to find yourself on the internet, good luck. But so practice daily your mantra, your prayer. Weekly, start a new life journal. Start thinking about these sort of things now. And monthly, very important to the process. Because if you aren't thinking straight, you're not going to get this straight. If you're uh, not healthy, you're not. This, this could be an, uh, an incumbent to your next um, incarnation. But so cleanse, cleanse mind, body, and spirit monthly. Take one weekend to do it. And then yearly, a yearly practice of celebrate. Celebrate your life. Do it on your birthday. Celebrate your next life. Start expanding on what we call a birthday um, because you will have another birthday. And the, the other thing is, I'd, I'd like to uh, say this to you, and that is that um, uh, my work is now entitled, uh, my, my story is now entitled The Death and the Afterlife of Melon Thomas. And by that I mean, and this, this is going to be funny, uh, but it's absolutely true. Did you know that this life you're living now is the afterlife? You're already in the afterlife. Because especially if you believe in reincarnation, <laughs> you've had previous lives. This is the afterlife to your previous incarnation. This is the afterlife. You're living the afterlife. And so the sooner we get a grip on that and change our incarnational trajectories and, and uh, uh, the positive and negative connections that come with us as we go, all that can be dealt with fairly easily. Not a big deal anymore. Um, so this is the afterlife. You're in the afterlife. Isn't that interesting? You don't have to die. And, and the afterlife, in other words, what I'm trying to say is the afterlife is not something over there. It's not on the other side. The other side is, is the hologram. This is where, where you're sitting right now is where everything wants to be. The entire universe has made you and wants to sit where you're sitting. No matter what you look like, no matter what language you speak, no matter what religion you are, the universe wants to be where you are. And I can tell you this, that the worst day of your life still has an infinite potential that could change everything. Uh, well, anyway, so I hope, uh, I, hope uh, <laughs> I didn't even get to about half the questions today, but we will cover them. And so I hope we've, uh, we've opened up the subject now and you kind of see where I'm coming from and where this might stretch you a little bit. And um, in, in the, next, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next week when we do the second part, it's going to get very interesting about incarnate, reincarnation among families, friends, and lovers. And what about big karma? How, how do you end karma? What is karma, really? It's not an esoteric belief system. There's no secret to it, actually. And uh, I think you're going to find this particularly interesting. Although, hold on, I have one, one, one emergency thing here that someone ne really needs an answer. Hold on, hold on. I'll tell you why in a second. Where is it? Where is it? Um, oh, here we go. Um, oh, there is a, a, a gentleman who wrote in whose wife is about to expect a baby. And I'm trying to find those notes right here. And you know, you know who you are, although I've can't find the notes right here, um, but you're expecting a baby pretty soon, and you want to know how you can find out what spirit or what who this is that's coming into your life. Well, this is the perfect time when the baby is this far along to ask the baby 
the baby is in cosmic awareness right now. We tend to lose that after we're born and we go through puberty and stuff and some of us keep it and we have to relearn it. But when the baby's in you at that stage of development, it's in cosmic awareness. Ask your baby. Your baby can tell you who they are. So with that, uh, we'll kind of end this session. And um, I look forward to the next session and many more of these. Um, and um, uh, so I thank you all for uh, even listening to me and hearing, hearing <laughs> some of what I've learned. And I hope it's uh, helped you in some way and you know, got you to think about things a little bit different way. Uh, this is going to expand. This is only the beginning of the things that we're going to explore together. So uh, may the light of life bless you all. Thank you so much. I'll see you later.